So good afternoon. Um, welcome to this week's Global uh, Immuno Talk. My name is Kate Fitzgerald. I'm a professor at UMass Chan Medical School here in uh, the greater Boston area. So just before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you next week's speaker is Jose Villadangos. So that will be March 29th. Um, without further ado, I want to I have a the real honor of introducing uh, a colleague of my own here at UMass Chan, who's actually a couple of floors above me here in the building that I'm in, um, who's gonna talk to us about her work on um, microglia and their role in sort of uh, neuroimmune signaling during uh, development and disease. And, and it's the role of these circuits in brain plasticity. So. Let me introduce Dory. So Dorothy, her Dory Schaefer is, received her bachelor's degree in neuroscience from Mount Holyoke uh, College uh, in Western Massachusetts in 2001. And then her PhD in biomedical sciences from the University of Connecticut Health Center in 2008. She then began her postdoc training at Boston Children's Hospital working with Dr. Beth Stevens. And there she really made, a, I think, a foundational discovery that microglia, the resident CNS macrophages, play an important role in sculpting neural circuits in the developing brain um, by engulfing a subset of sort of less active synapses using the complement system, which I think we'll hear a little bit about today and also some newer work from her lab. Dr. Schaefer is a, a leader in the field of microglia biology and neural immune interactions. Uh, her earlier postdoc work really sort of, you know, was foundational establishing the important role of microglia in um, synaptic pruning uh, in these systems. She joined UMass Chan Medical School uh, in 2015, where she was the recipient of a, a K99 R00 Pathway to Independence Award. She's also received numerous NIH awards, a Charles Hood Research Award, a NARSAD Young Investigator Award. And then she, had, she was the recipient of an honorable mention for the Brain Behavior Research Foundation Freeman Award. Uh, she's been highly cited. She's received numerous awards here at UMass for her mentoring and early career achievements in research. And Dory's lab really, I think, is at the cutting edge of microglia biology, leveraging really molecular mechanistic approaches to dissect these important circuits. So it's a real pleasure, Dory, to have you here. We're really excited to hear about um, your work. But, but just before we do that, we, as part of this series we you know we bring fantastic scientists like you to the global immunology and actually broader even than immunology community but trainees all across the world i think it's really important to hear a little bit about the scientists not just the science so we typically ask a question and i was going to ask you a little bit about your mentorship style and how has it changed and evolved over time as your own career has progressed Thank you so much, Abe. And that was a really kind introduction. And um, I, you know, I, as far as mentoring, I would say it's still evolving. Um, but, you know, I think you know, mentoring is something I'm really passionate about. It's so, something that's very rewarding to me. And one thing, I think the major thing that I've learned since I've become a PI is how to like, that I need to tailor my mentoring style depending on the individual. Um, that's really come clear. I used to kind of uh, coming into it, um, you know, meeting with everybody once a week and, and everybody needed this. And, it, you know, and I, I implemented this yearly review process with people that I have my own evaluation form. And I always learn something new. I do it every year. Yeah. Uh, but the first thing that I learned was that everybody didn't like how I was, <laughs> everybody didn't want to meet once a week, or everybody didn't want to present, they wanted to present, you know, more often at the lab, you know, so they needed more from this for me or less for this for this for me. And it was different for every single person. So yeah, it's, um, not, I really, it's rarely a one size fits all. Exactly. So, you know, I think that was like the biggest thing. And I think that's the biggest challenge of mentoring. And I, you know, 
I didn't, you always, you know, as a person, you tend to kind of gravitate toward people that are like yourself. So kind of trying to step away from that and see how other people are coming from that, from their point of view um, and learning from that. So that's really how it's evolved over time is really continuing to tailor my entering style, adding new aspects also for career development, where I have a career development panel come in from my lab once a year of people that I know in different fields and just for my lab. And I oh, that's a great talk. idea. Um, and that's been really great. Um, I give a one once a year in the State of the Union where I discuss how I do budgeting and where the money goes and all that, because um, that's something I didn't know when I started. Yep. So yep. Know, those type of things I think have also I've learned are really helpful for trainees where it's not such a black box of yep. what to do next. So, Great. Dory, your audio is a little crackly. I don't know. Maybe you can just be a little bit closer to the. Okay, sure. Oh, oh that's better, yeah. actually. That's yeah. much better. Okay. Okay. So um, go ahead and share your screen, and then the stage is yours. And we're really excited to uh, hear about your work. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Kate. Great. Perfect. That looking okay? Yeah, looks great. great. Excellent. Okay. Let me just hide the control panels so that this is not. Yeah, we're okay. not seeing anything. Okay, perfect. Okay, Looks good. Uh, okay. um, so, all right, cool. Uh, thank you so much, Kate, and for the Global Immuno Talks community. Um, it's my pleasure and I'm excited to talk about our work on this emergence of immune molecules in cells regulating neural circuits. Um, so if we kind of take a step back for a moment, we, we peer inside the brain, we would see billions of neurons. This, of course, isn't actually from a human brain, it's from a mouse brain that expresses different variants of GFP um, and in different color. And you can see the kind of variety of different types of neurons and colors in the brain here. And of course, this gets even more complex if you were to look inside the human brain. Um, and these, you know, billions are of neurons are con connected by trillions of synapses. And these synapses are the sites at which neurotransmitters released from one neuron to the next. And the vast majority of neuroscience research has really focused, taken kind of more of a neurocentric view. Um, and, you know, rightfully so, neurons are extremely important for overall function of the nervous system. But if we were to kind of then zoom in on these neural circuits, we'd see other types of cells besides neurons. And in fact, upwards of about 50% of the brain are comprised of other cell types called glial cells. Um, which one subtype I'm highlighting here with this arrow, these pom-pom looking types of cells here called astrocytes. So in fact, here's an astrocyte again here on the left, um, which these cells we now appreciate, they unsheathe synapses and they provide critical support for regulating the transmission of neurotransmitter from one side of the synapse to the next side of the synapse. They also provide critical metabolic support. And for example, they'll ensheathe also blood vessels and provide coupling between the blood vessel and the neural, and neural circuits. There's also oligodendrocytes, dendrocytes, a different type of glial cell um, that produce this really rich lipid sheath called the myelin sheath that surrounds axons of neurons. And it's really critical for these cells to be there because they regulate the speed and uh, uh, propagation of electrical signal from one neuron to the next. And that electrical signal is critical for the release of neurotransmitter. And then of course the cells that we're primarily focused on in my lab are microglial cells. Um, as Kate had mentioned, these are a resident macrophage population of the central nervous system, including the brain and spinal cord. And they really sit um, within the, the bed of synaptic connections and in neural circuits. Uh, and so kind of honing in on these microglial cells, um, they were first described in the early 1900s by Peo de Rio Ortega, um, shown here. He was a student of Ramon E. Cajal, who's really kind of the godfather of neuroscience, um, where they, they made these really beautiful drawings based on stainings that they developed that allowed them to see cells in the brain for the first time. Um, and in fact, this particular stain allowed uh, that Peo de Rio Ortega had actually developed, allowed us to finally see microglia. So you can see these microglia somas here, um, highlighted by the arrows and all their little fine processes irradiating from the soma. Uh, and what he 
I think astutely said when he was um, making these initial observations, and this is just in these static images, hand drawings, he said there's, that microglia's shape is mutable and conditional. Their protoplasm is capable of plasticity. They have in short a quality inherent to the, which the migrant corpuscles, meaning neural circuits, for which they belong and must, um, microglia must be included. So, you know, I think um, that really, I just found this astounding that, you know, he made this observation in the early 1900s and his, his this is actually now coming to fruition. Um, so if you actually look at papers published with the word astrocyte, oligodendrocyte, or microglia, or neuron in the black line in the title, um, these are different, the, these two y-axes are different um, ways to quantify this, but um, they essentially you see that there is an exponential rise in papers published, um, and this is actually from 2016, so this is even probably more exaggerated now, of papers published with the word microglia in the title, even up, reaching up to, the, to those that have the word neuron or nervous system in the title, which is really remarkable. So what happened at this 2005 inflection point? So um, it first started with a, a fluorescent reporter mouse. Um, this fractal con this uh, this fractal kind receptor or CX three CR one uh, reporter that drove GFP. This was created by Stefan Young when he was in Dan Lepman's lab, and we could first for the first time fluorescently label um, without antibody all the microglia in the brain and could see that five to ten percent of total CNS cells were comprised of microglial cells, and we could zoom in on these cells and see their soma and all these very fine processes. But what then this reporter mouse allowed us to do as a field is to now actually image them live. Um, and there were two really um, seminal studies in 2005 um, by Axel Nimron when he was in the Helmchen lab, as well as Demetrius Devalos when he was in Wemby Algan's lab, where they put these cranial windows or cover slips over the brain of these mice that express GFP in the microglia and then we were able to live image them. And what they first showed, um, here are all the microglia here, um, kind of now in grayscale. Um, if you laser ablate, what you could see here is the timestamp here. Within minutes, these microglia are rapidly coming along and, she, and really kind of shielding this injury site, a very robust wound healing response, but also releasing a lot of pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines or phagocytosing debris, a really robust response. Um, and so this is this was the first time we had actually visualized this in real time. But what was even more remarkable is if we look without even any injury, these microglia were always constantly serving their their environment, their extracellular environment with their processes. And it was estimated that the entire microglia population could survey the entire brain parenchyma within just a few hours. So it really was opened up the field to ask, what are these microglia actually doing under steady state conditions? And it turns out now we know they can regulate various aspects of neuronal development and, and function um, and from regulating synapses to regulating accent outgrowth. You may have heard about, from that from Sonia Garrell um, who gave another one of these talks, regulating neural progenitor cells, um, regulating other types of glial cells like the astrocytes and oligodendrocytes that I talked about, and they could even regulate the vasculature and branching of the vasculature. I'm going to be focusing on this synaptic function for microglia for the rest of the talk. So historically, I've been studying this in the context of development, where as we kind of experience our world around us, our neural circuits get shaped. And in particular, they go through the stereotypical pruning process. And what do I mean by that? So if we were to stain neurons, this is actually human postmortem tissue um, in the prefrontal cortex of a six-year-old versus a 14-year-old. And you label neurons with this black dye, which is shown here. Um, you can see within between the six-year-old and the 14-year-old, this dramatic reduction in the amount of processes between neurons. And that's um, defined as pruning. That's pruning back of excess connections between cells that typically form an excess during early development. If we were to zoom in on this, these synapses and look at them in a more schematic form. Here's one neuron and it's receiving lots of these synapses where again, where the site of neurotransmitters released from one neuron to the next, where these cell bodies of these red and blue cells are probably way out here and here's their axons and then here's where they released the neurotransmitter. These synaptic connections, again, they form um, an excess during early development and then through this activity dependent mechanism, 
they then are sculpted into mature neural, neural circuits where subsets of synapses are eliminated and then the remaining synapses are strengthened and elaborated in the circuit. And we now also appreciate that defects in this pruning program may underlie, for example, autism spectrum disorders as well as other neuropsychiatric disorders where it's now been observed both in animal models but also in human and disease is that there seems to be um, over pruning or under pruning depending on the disorder as well as the brain region. But also understanding these basic mechanisms and development could also be relevant for neurodegenerative diseases, for example, like Alzheimer's disease, where early synapse loss seems to be a hallmark feature of many of these diseases. So it's the question is, could some of these developmental mechanisms be apparently upregulated at the wrong time and place to lead to this early synapse loss? Um, so what we're trying to understand, kind of giving you the basic framework for the rest of the talk, is are microglia involved in synaptic pruning during development? And do these, do we, does this actually have implications for a neurological disease? So when I was a postdoc, I had studied this in the context of developmental synaptic pruning, that normal developmental process, and used this classic circuit, uh, model circuit in the mouse, which is called the retinogeniculate circuit. And five days after birth in a mouse or P5 is a peak period in this pruning program. Um, and this particular circuit is comprised of these retinal ganglion cells, which are the neurons that sit in the retina in the eye. And then they send their axon deep inside the brain where they then form synapses in a deep structure called the lateral geniculate nucleus or LGN. Um, so when we looked at during this peak pruning window in this circuit, and we looked at microglial interactions with synapses, what we found was that these microglia here in green, the synapses are in red and blue, are actually engulfing bits of synaptic material. So you can see red and blue inside the cytoplasm of the cell. So, okay, well, what was the, what's the mechanism? So microglia express lots of different phagocytic receptors. I'm certainly not including all of them here, but one flavor that was really exciting to us were these complement receptors here. And why were we so excited about these rece complement receptors was um, that we knew um, through work from Beth Stevens when she was in the Barris lab that mice deficient in this cl in classical complement cascade molecules like C1Q and C3 had defects in synaptic pruning in that retinoculate circuit, but we didn't understand how that was working. So we thought, well, you know, maybe we could take some hints from the immune system where um, the classical complement cascade, of course, is one of your first defenses to fight an infection or invading pathogen or debris. Um, and clear this debris or pathogen, where C1Q, the initiating molecule in the cascade, will tag or bind the surface, initiating a whole downstream cascade of events, ultimately leading to the deposition of the downstream component C3, which then leads to the clearance of this, for example, bacterial cell, either through cell lysis or through phagocytosis by cells that express complement receptors. Well, it turns out microglia express complement receptors as well. And we found that C1Q and C3 in the developing brain in particular were highly localized to synaptic compartments. And then um, we knew that microglia expressed the complement receptor 3, also known as CD11B. And if we get rid of this phagocytic signaling, we could block microglia from eating synapses by about 50%. And then if we looked at the number of synaptic puncta, so these red, these purple and green are pre and post synaptic elements. And when they co-localize, that's a synapse. We found there were more synapses in the knockout, suggesting that microglia weren't able to, again, clear and eliminate excess synapses. So in the wild type, they look nicely the refined and in knockouts, they look way less mature um, and compared to the wild type litter mates. So now we have a model where microglia via the classical complement cascade, we're engulfing and removing subsets of synapses during development in a normal developmental process called synaptic pruning. So kind of bringing neurodegener neurodegeneration back into the question um, here is um, now, could these developmental mechanisms actually be apparently upregulated at the wrong time and place to lead to this early synapse loss, which we think underlies cognitive decline in many of these diseases? And in fact, that seems to, um, there's some strong evidence for this already um, in mouse models relevant to Alzheimer's disease and frontal temporal dementia and infection models. We've been tackling this question in the context of multiple sclerosis. 
So of course, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease and infl of infl induces inflammatory demyelination. Um, so it removes that myelin sheath that oligodendrocytes normally produce. And it leaves these lesions that you can see on MRI, which are highlighted by these white arrows. So you could think of MS as actually being one of the few success stories of neurological disorders and that we actually have FDA approved therapies. Um, they mainly target the peripheral immune system or prevent autoimmune attack, um, but it's still, um, it doesn't um, negate the fact that many patients still go on to have progressive neurodegenerative disease in the end. And this is still an unmet clinical need. And I would argue perhaps we could gain insights into early phases of neurodegeneration that could be, if we study MS, because we're following these patients, you know, a lot of times since they've been in their 20s, maybe even earlier, um, and that could give insights into early phases of neurodegeneration in multiple different disorders. Um, for example, in Alzheimer's disease where patients might come to the clinic too late. So well, the majority of MS research is really focused on how to protect myelin or promote remyelination of axons by oligodendrocytes, and rightfully so, but um, there's been relatively less studied in the context of what happens to the synaptic connections um, of those neurons that either lose their, their sheath or are exposed to an inflammatory um, event uh, in the context of MS. So this was a question that was undertaken by a former postdoc in my lab, Sebastian Bordeberg, um, who actually now has his own lab at University of Michigan. He just started this year, and I'm very proud of him. Um, so, um, and Sebastian decided to leverage this retina geniculate circuit um, to ask this question. Um, and I already introduced you to it. It's that circuit that we've studied in development, but it's also highly relevant to MS um, because actually inflammation of the optic nerve and tract is a very common feature in MS patients and it's accompanied by visual impairment. And even after this inflammation subsides, patients will, go, will still complain of visual impairment and we don't understand why. So we started this with a collaboration with Daniel Reich's lab at the NIH. Um, who provided some human MS tissue. Um, here's the human retinogeniculate circuit. And so the retinal ganglion cells are here in the eyes. They send their axons in through the optic nerve, and then they synapse again in the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the structure we'll be looking at synapses. And what Sebastian first found was a, a reduction in synapses in the postmortem MS LGNs um, compared to controls. And he also found evidence of microglia eating synapses. So here's um, a label, green is labeling the microglial cells. The red is labeling the synapses, which is an antibody against this marker, vesicular glutamate transporter two or VGLUT2. And inside you can, the microglia can detect um, this phagocytose synaptic material, which has increased in incidence in the MS cases versus control. Um, we also collaborate with uh, the Reich lab to look at a, a preclinical marmoset model of MS, this experimental autoimmune encephalitis model where you can inject these non-human primates with either um, human myelin or human myelin peptide, and they mount an autoimmune response and have very similar relapsing remitting features to MS patients. Um, and then we, um, Daniel, Daniel Reich's lab per, um, then gave us tissue of the marmoset LGNs. Uh, to look at synapses. And what we found, the red is labeling the synapses, the green is labeling the microglia again. The red, you can see a clear reduction in the synapses in the EAE LGNs compared to control in the marmosets, just like we saw in the human MS cases. And if we, again, if similar to human MS, if we look inside these microglia cells, we can detect synaptic protein inside them. So this was all well and good, you know, but this is all postmortem tissue from human that people that have had disease for a long period of time. The marmosets, it's really hard to, to get this tissue at early stages of disease. So these, these animals have had disease for a while. Um, so it's hard to detect, ask, you know, is this synapse loss a separable event from other neurodegeneration or is it always a consequence of neurons dying, demyelination, et cetera? And in either case, we wanna understand what's the mechanism of how synapses are lost. So to tackle these questions, we've turned to a mouse model, um, the mouse model experimental autoimmune encephalitis or EAE, which many of you in this audience might be familiar with already, um, but very similar to the marmoset model, we inject these mice, um, this is a C57 black six model, 
um, for any aficionados in the audience, um, with a MOG peptide, it's a myelin peptide, they mount an autoimmune response that's mainly T cell mediated um, to kind of have this monophasic disease course. Um, and here's clinical score here on the y-axis, days post immunization here on the x-axis. And what Sebastian decided to do was start to look at these questions is really to look at the onset of disease, at early stages of disease in these mice compared to, for example, if we were to look at peak. And what he saw, even at the onset of disease, he found a reduction in these synapses in the EAE um, mice compared to the, the adjuvant-treated controls. Um, just like we saw in human MS cases and in the marmoset. Of course, now we want to ask, well, okay, we see these reduction in synapses, but is it just a consequence of other pathology going on? But consistent with it being a separable event, he did not detect any changes in neurons, no, no cell death yet, no changes in the density of axons or any, uh, this is summarizing a lot of data on one slide, um, no changes in axons yet. This was actually true about the mouse EAE and in the marmoset. And also in the mouse EAE model, he detected no change in the myelin sheath yet. If he, even if he looked at the gold standard by EM, where you can use this kind of black um, outline, here's the axons, the black outline is the myelin sheath. You can look at the thickness of this myelin sheath. So there didn't seem to be any detectable changes in the myelin yet either. So these syna the synaptic pathology was going on a lot earlier. But what he did see was peripheral evidence for peripheral immune cell infiltration. It was mild, but there were some T cells and leukocytes present. Um, he saw evidence of glial cells becoming more reactive um, and pro-inflammatory. So for example, astrocytes will upregulate this marker GFAP in the EAE brains. And microglia here, which normally express this marker called P2RY12 under steady state conditions, they downregulate it, um, which I think you can appreciate here from this fluorescence image um, when they become more inflammatory. And they also change their morphology and they become, they assume this more reactive morphology where they retract all those fine processes and their somas get a lot larger. Um, and then if we look inside these more reactive cells, we can detect synaptic material, just like we saw in the marmoset and EA and um, model in, in the human MS cases, where the, inside the green microglia, you can see VGLUT2 um, labeled synapses inside the microglial cells, telling us microglia were engulfing synapses in the EAE compared to the control brains. So now, of course, we want to turn back to what's the mechanism and can we block it and can we protect synapses? Um, and so um, we've turned back to our old friend complement, given our my earlier work in development and the synapse pruning in the same circuit. Um, and um, also Peter Calabrese's lab had shown really interestingly um, that human MS patients with more severe visual system degeneration actually had um, genetic variants of early, um, that were specific to early complement genes. So this was really interesting to us as well. So Sebastian first looked at complement levels, both C1Q and C3, which both seem to increase in the LGN where we're looking at synapse loss in that retina geniculate circuit in the EAE versus control brains. Um, but interestingly, when we, the VGLUT2 and green here is labeling the synapses, um, the arrowheads are pointing to each synapse, you don't ever see C1Q co-localized to the synapse, really. So this was unlike what we used to see in development where it was co-localized with synapses. But in contrast, C3 was highly synaptic. So you can see each one of these arrowheads pointing to a synapse is also positive for C3, which you can see here as yellow co-localization. And this was also true in another mouse model we looked at, um, I won't go into the details, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about that offline. And we also saw this in the marmoset model as well. So this suggests to us that in this inflammatory demyelinating disease model, um, we see early synapse loss prior to myelin pathology and other pathologies. And it seems to be, um, and we it suggests to us that complements there, but it might be bypassing C1Q and going through this alternative complement cascade, which really goes directly through C3. So we wanted to test this further. And what we decided to do is take a strategy to overexpress an inhibitor of C3 called Curry 
specifically in these retinal ganglion cells, these neurons whose synapses we're looking at inside the brain. So we collaborate with the Gene Therapy Center at UMass Med and, and Dr. Joaquin Gao, um, and who's director of that center, um, and made an AV9 vector where we could express, um, overexpress the C3 inhibitor curry, fused to a domain of CR2. This, uh, this is a complement receptor 2, which binds only activated forms of C3. And other groups have shown if you take this peptide and, and put it, inject it IP, for example, it will really hone to sites only of activated C3 and not, for example, um, work prior to when C3 is processed. Um, so this was really um, interesting strategy for us to think about. It could also like tell us where the activated forms of C3 are localized, as it also has a GFP reporter. So Sebastian injected the AAV into the eyes. He waited several weeks and then performed the EAE in these mice and then started his analysis of onset of disease. If he looked at curry protein, this is immunostaining for curry protein. That's the inhibitor that we're expressing. You can see um, in control virus treated animals with EAE, there's an overall kind of increase in the background of this curry protein, but only in the curry AAV treated animals do you see kind of these more bulbous looking structures, which I, are more reminiscent of the synapses we've been looking at. And actually when we looked at co-localization of curry, and synapse, synaptic marker, we see that they're high, this curry protein really localized to the synaptic compartment. And that's quantified here, high enrichment of curry protein in the synaptic compartment versus non-synaptic compartment, the gray bars um, with EAE. So this tells us not only can we actually localize our therapeutic um, to the right compart cellular compartment, but also it tells us because the CR2 only binds where activated C3 is, is that at the synapses, there is activated forms of C3. So Sebastian then quantified the levels of C3, which we know increase in EAE condition with uh, control virus treated animals with the curry AAV that decreases, not totally back to control levels, but significantly decreased from um, the control virus. Um, but what does um, bring back, what does come back to control levels is the C3 co-localized with the GLUT2. So the C3 no longer goes to the synapses, but it doesn't block C1Q. Um, so the, the molecule that's typically can be upstream of C3, for example, in the classical complement cascade. Um, we went on to look at microglial engulfment of synapses, which is shown here, zoom in here with the yellow arrows which we know microglia engulf synapses with the e in EAE. This is control virus treated animals. And again, with the curry treatment, we can see a decrease in the synapse engulfment um, by microglial cells. And, and, and importantly, it doesn't block myelin phagocytosis by microglia. Um, this is important because the phagocytosis of myelin is a very important function for microglia in promoting remyelination in MS. Um, you need them to clear that debris for new myelin to form. And it's also been shown that myelin clearance can be regulated by complement. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this was not affecting that important function for microglia as well. It's very specific to the synapses. So, okay, we want to ask, ultimately, are, are the synapses protected? We've shown that it can decrease complement at synapses. It can decrease microglial um, engulfment of synapses with the e, in the EAE model. And sure enough, when we looked at synapses, which are now labeled here in green, these puncta here, C3 is in red. Um, you can see with the AAV curry treated animals, a really um, a significant attenuation of the synapse loss in the LGN in the EAE model. And when not only did we look at synapse structure, but we also looked at function. Um, so we can measure visual function using this visual acuity task. It's an optimotor task. We basically place a mouse on a platform, <coughs> Sorry, and you play a grading across its visual field. And those, as that grading gets closer and closer together, so as the spatial frequency increases, the mouse can stop stops being able to tell a grading from just a gray screen and will no longer track. So you measure the visual, the, um, the spatial frequency when the mouse stops tracking. Um, so we uh, injected the AAVs, performed a visual acuity um, analysis four weeks later. This is without any EAE. So we, it's, so we then found that the viral injection itself didn't affect the visual acuity score, which was nice. This was well without EAE. And then the same animals, we then induced EAE. Um, and then control virus treated animals or animals that didn't receive any AAV, 
there did not, there seemed to be a, a significant reduction in the visual acuity score, but this was significantly protected with the Korea AV treated animals. So not only are we able to protect synapse structure, but also function if we block C3 at the synapse. So summarizing the data I've just talked about so far was with inflammatory demyelinating disease. Um, we've done a lot with the mouse EAE model, but we also have evidence now in human MS tissue as well as in that marmoset model that you have uh, microglia eating synapses through a C3 dependent me mechanism. And this seems to be independent of it. While it can occur as a consequence of neurons degenerating or demyelination, it can also occur independent of these events. Um, and it had, um, we had all, we always see it when we see um, inflammatory glial cells. If we inject this AAV curry um, to block C3, we can basically block it from depositing its synapses and block microglia from eating synapses, but we don't block their ability to eat other myelin. And also it seems like kind of the inflammatory response still continues, which I also think could be important um, in, in the case of some of these inflammatory processes are important for recovery. Um, and I should mention that I told you all the data for the onset of disease, but it also protects a peak disease in the EAE model. So new questions that we're now exploring that I'm gonna talk about for the remainder of the talk um, are what cells are making complement and where. Um, C1Q is not at synapses, but it still increases with the, with, um, in MS cases as well as EAE, um, could it still be playing a role in neurodegeneration? Um, and can we actually target complement therapeutically? Is this a viable therapeutic strategy? Um, so I'm gonna be showing you a little data at the end on the role of C1Q, um, but to start, I'm gonna talk about what cells could be making complement in this context. So you can think about single cell RNA sequencing as a very useful approach for asking what cells make what type of molecule, for example. Um, but there are caveats because we also want to know where these cells are in the brain. Um, and you really lose the spatial information as you make a single cell suspension or a single nucleus prep. Um, and the dissociation itself can induce an inflammatory response. And you're limited on sequencing depth. You're really kind of uh, biasing towards more um, abundant transcripts. So to overcome some of these caveats, we've decided to implement a spatial transcriptomic approach in my lab. Um, and in particular, specifically, we've implemented um, multiplexed error robust fluorescence in situ hybridization, or MRFish, which was a technique developed by Zhao Wei Zhang's lab when she was uh, at Harvard. And essentially, um, what you it involves having an RNA of interest, um, and you have RNA probes for that RNA of interest that are fluorescently labeled. You add to your tissue, you quench, you do this over and over and over again until you get this map of RNAs across your tissue. Um, and you can get global distribution of transcripts across the entire tissue slice. You can also get cell type specific gene expression and where these cells are localized. But you can also even get down to subcellular distribution because this is single molecule fish. Um, just like if you've ever used RNA scope, it's kind of like RNA scope on steroids is how I like to call it. Um, so Travis and Violetta in my lab um, have did an initial experiment. Violetta has been really the driver of, of MRFish in my lab, um, but Travis has really been helpful on the computational side. Um, they took um, both EAE, mouse EAE brains, as well as CFA control brains um, at the onset of disease and probed them um, for cell, a bunch of cell type specific genes so we could label specific cell populations and layer on top of that different complement genes as well as some genes in this probe library that's major inflammatory pathways. So we can look at, you know, this is partic this particular experiment, we're looking at 309 genes at once. Um, and so here's an EAE brain where we've labeled all these different cell types in, in the different colors here, um, based on cell specific markers that we know exist. And we can make probes against those, RNA probes against those transcripts um, here, we can also make a UMAP plot, which you might be more in, um, used to looking at um, in single cell RNA sequencing data sets. Um, this is combining the EAE and CFA brains to see the distribution of different cell clusters, all the different cell types. And then what we can do is say, okay, we know all these cell types. Now, where are the genes that we're interested in? Who's making them? So for example, C1Q, we could see enrichment in microglia and myeloid cells, which was consistent with what published literature. But then when we look at C3, some in really interesting things start to pop out. For example, 
it, we knew that, you know, you know that peripheral immune cells can start that do can express C3, particularly in EAE. But when we look at resident populations in the CNS, reactive astrocytes and ependymal cells seem to be um, expressing a lot of these this C3. So this is something, a not, next direction that we're taking is to really look at the cell-specific expression of C3 and see, ask who's making the C3 that's leading to the synapse loss, for example. And we can also, not only in the course of beauty of neurofaces, we can look at those UMAP plots and say what cells are making it, but now where are those cells that are making C1Q and C3? So here are CFA controls. You can see the distribution of cells making C1Q. These are all really microglia. C3, you can kind of see these borders, um, probably meninges as well as along the ventricle, which is where the ependymal cells are localized. And if we look at the EAE brains, we can start to see hot spots of the of cells expressing these molecules. And it really is hot spots that border the lateral geniculate nucleus or LGN, where we've been seeing the synapse loss, um, as well as the hippocampus where other groups have shown synapse loss. So I think this is really interesting. So now we're making a more exhaustive MRFISH library to look at many different other complement related genes, the receptors, molecules that, that act as inhibitors of complement, et cetera. Um, to really kind of map more uh, globally complement regulation um, in, in neuroinflammation. Um, and kind of going off, um, I, I talked about what cells are making complement and really a next future direction that we're now taking and a little bit of data on this is asking what role does C1Q play? Because it still is high with inflammation, um, but it's just not, we don't see it at the synapse. So we started to address this, and again, a collaboration with Daniel Reich's uh, group um, where he has done this really gorgeous MR um, of these um, human MS as well as the marmoset EAE model. And he's he's um, really followed these chronic active lesions in MS cases, which we call quote unquote smoldering lesions, where you have these iron rich rim around the lesion. Um, here's, a, here's a cartoon of this lesion. And what he found um, was that C1Q was very high in microglia right at the edge, that growing edge of the lesion. So um, we wanted to ask, um, could microglia derived C1Q actually be playing a role in propagating inflammation around these chronic active MS lesions? So we took a genetic approach to start to address this question. And Anya Song, when she was in my lab, crossed a C1Q floxed mouse to a microglia specific inducible Cree line. Um, and induced recombination uh, around weaning, and then waited and performed EAE several months or a couple months later. Um, here's a wild type animal with EAE and a C1Q immunostaining. You can see C1Q really high across the entire brain, particularly at the hippocampus and the LGN, which is in this area. And when we ablate C1Q just from microglia, you can see all the staining is gone. So all this staining is, is derived from microglia, either secreting C1Q or expressing C1Q inside them, their cytosol. Um, so then we went on to look um, at what happens to microgliosis and inflammation in these brains. And what we found first is that we first looked at the morphology of the microglial cells and we can quantify them um, where less reactive cells tend to have this more ramified morphology where they have this small cell body and lots of little fine processes. And then this ranges all the way down to a more reactive cell, which we call amoeboid cells that kind of retract all the processes and have a much more enlarged soma. So in animals that are, these are wild type animals with EAE, you see a shift from the ramified population to this more reactive amoeboid population of cell. And when the conditional knockout, it shifts these microglia back to the more ramified um, uh, cell morphology. We also looked at the disease-associated microglia signature, um, so this, or DAM signature, which was identified by EDO and Meat, as well as Oleg Butovsky independently, um, where they found this really unique transcriptional si signature that's unique to these disease-associated microglia, particularly in neurodegeneration, which is characterized by increase in certain types of markers like PLEX7A and a decrease in their homeostatic markers like P2RY12. Um, so here's an example of a marker, one of these DAM markers, CLEX7A. In EAE brains, this is wild type animals, you see an increase in CLEX7A compared to controls. But in the, the C1Q conditional knockouts, it, we now see that this CLEX7A, this DAM phenotype seems to be attenuated in the EAE model. So in summary, 
We have inflammatory demyelinating disease. Our earlier work had found a role for complement C3, but not C1Q at synapses to regulate microglial engulfment and elimination of synapses in this in um, inflammation. We also saw an increase in C1Q, um, but not at the synapse. Um, if we block C1Q, now we can basically attenuate this um, uh, reactive gliosis and the microglia look more like a homeostatic resting ramified state. Um, oops, so um, next directions we're now taking are to ask, does C1Q regulate the production of C3 even if it's not at the synapse? Could C1Q from the microglia regulate C3 production by other cell types like the ependymal cells I mentioned or for example, reactive astrocytes? Um, how does C1Q regulate the reactive state of microglia more generally? Um, how does it regulate this transition? And that's another area of active investigation in my lab. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody in my lab. Without them, none of this would be possible. Um, they've done some fabulous work, um, particular um, Sebastian, who really started the whole MS project, Anya Song for the, her work on the conditional knockouts that I talked about, um, and then Travis and Violetta for their work on the Murfish project um, and our collaborators and of course our funding sources. And thank you so much for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions on Twitter. Great story. That was a tour de force. Yeah, really beautiful talk. So thank you so much. So just, I think while Fozia gets the slide deck up, just to remind everybody how to address their questions to Dory. So We'll do this via Twitter. You can search for the Global Immunotalks and there'll be a tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Dory Schaefer here. And then she's gonna use her own uh, at Schaefer Lab UMass uh, Twitter handle um, to address your questions. So hopefully you'll get some interesting questions from our global trainees and faculty and others. So thanks a lot, Dory, that was terrific. Thank, Thank you. you for joining. Yeah, bye-bye.